So it's a real pleasure to um, introduce Professor Lucy Delmott from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And uh, she will uh, present uh, a seminar uh, on molecular basis of modulation of voltage gated ion channels. Please. Okay, thank you. Um, can you just confirm you can see my screen, my pointer and here I'm fine? Yes, everything works. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I want to start by thanking the organizers for um, inviting me and also for putting together this workshop, which uh, I feel like under current circumstances is turning out really well. I'm quite impressed by the quality of the discussions we're having. So thank you for that. And uh, let me get started on, on my talk where I will uh, indeed talk about voltage gated ion channels. So, uh, of course, uh, everybody I think in this audience is quite aware that voltage gated ion channels are important in physiology, in excitable cells and others. Um, and the way these voltage gated ion channels can, uh, can function in order to create pretty complicated biological function is because um, they are actually um, have their action that are coordinated. And uh, voltage-gated ion channels can differ in quite different many ways. One of the most obvious ones is related to the talk we just heard and is related to their selectivity. So, of course, some, uh, some voltage-gated ion channels transport preferentially potassium, others sodium, others calcium, others are relatively non-selective. But there are many other ways that voltage-gated ion channels are different. And uh, one of them is uh, that the voltage at which they open and close could be different and the kinetics of those could be also different. So depending on where they end up being expressed uh, in different parts of uh, complicated cells like the one you see on the, on the screen, um, this will lead to pretty complicated biological function and the propagation of action potentials, which is of course very important for physiology. But biology is even more complicated than this. Um, and uh, what I want to touch upon uh, today, and is quite different, I think, from what we've heard so far in the, the workshop, is about voltage-gated modulation. And of course, there are many ways that these ion channels can be uh, modulated. One of them is uh, through post translational modification. One of them could be uh, related to where they are expressed. And here today, I want to focus on uh, actually three types of modulations. And that is modulation by the lipids that are uh, in the membrane, by auxiliary proteins, like the one we can see here, calmodulin, uh, and by small molecules, which I will touch upon uh, later. And I just want to um, take advantage of this slide to introduce us to the basic structural features of voltage-gated ion channels, or so they are um, a tetrameric assembly. Here we can see two subunits, but there's one in the front and one in the back that are not represented here. Um, and they are made of, uh, let's say, two essential transmembrane domains, the voltage sensor domain, which is made up by four helices, which you can see here, and the pore domain, which is made by the tetrameric assembly of two transmembrane segments. And then additionally to this, in a lot of voltage-gated channels, we have uh, quite big intracellular domains that participate in regulating its function. So like I just said, uh, I want here to talk about two types of, uh, or three types of modulations, but this is divided in uh, two studies. And the first study I will uh, talk about is a, a study on KCNQ1, which is also called KD7.1, which is a cardiac, uh, channel and how it's modulated by the auxiliary subunit calmodulin and by the lipid uh, phosphatidylinositol uh, 2 phosphate with 2 And the second part of the talk will be about the modulation of the famous shaker channel by resin acid derivatives. And so my lab is a lab uh, that does exclusively computational methods or uses computational methods to investigate uh, the function of membrane proteins and ion channels in particular. Um, and uh, we tend to um, use both sort of basic molecular dynamic simulations and modeling strategies as well as advanced um, strategies. 
Uh, but what we do and is quite characteristic is that we collaborate with uh, many groups that do the experimental counterpart to the work that we do. And so these two works that I'm going to talk about are done in collaboration. Uh, the first one with the lab of uh, Jan Min Sui, who's from Washington University in St. Louis in the US. And the second uh, will be uh, done in collaboration with Frederick Ellender and his lab, and that's at Linköping University, uh, our neighbors in Sweden. And so what I want you to take from this talk in general is um, the, the synergy between uh, the, the two labs and how we work really in parallel to be able to get answers into pretty complicated questions at this point. So let me start with uh, the KCNQ1 story. Um, and um, so like I said, this is a cardiac channel that requires calmodulin to uh, assemble and traffic to the plasma membrane. And it also requires PIP2 to open. So this is, for example, the scheme where you can see that uh, the channel will um, open under regular conditions, but then when you introduce a chemical that depletes PIP2 from the membrane, you see the current disappear. And by re-adding PIP2 uh, into the solution, it gets incorporated into the membrane, and then you have the channel that opens again. And uh, again, you can get rid of that current by depleting PIP2. So this is not uh, novel, of course, uh, but the, the way PIP2 operates and the way calmodulin, the role that calmodulin plays, not in assembly, uh, but in activation and gating is quite ambiguous. And this is what we set out to work on uh, in this project. So functionally, um, like I described before, um, the channel is made of two transmembrane domains, a voltage sensor domain and a pore domain. And when uh, the membrane is depolarized, we have an upward motion of the voltage sensor domain, which will cause the channel to open. Um, KCNQ1 has a specificity com compared to other channels like Shaker, is that it activates in two step uh, through uh, uh, um, resting an intermediate state and an activated state uh, up here. And uh, to complicate the picture, like I said before, KCNQ1 is regulated by PIP2. And in fact, it needs PIP2 to open. So if PIP2 is not present, what you end up having is a voltage sensor that activates, but the, chlor the pore remains closed. And only when PIP2 is present does the coupling between the voltage sensor domain and the pore occur and uh, activated rest voltage sensor is coupled to an open gate. And uh, we're very lucky uh, with the resolution revolution uh, that has been going on in cryo-electron microscopy to have structures of the KCN Q1 channel. And uh, even more lucky that we don't have it only in one uh, state that was resolved in 2017, but since 2019 also in a different state. And so uh, what we can see from those uh, different pictures is that there's a pretty big rearrangement going on here, mainly in the intracellular domain when PIP2 is inserted into the preparation. So it turns out that in these structures, the voltage sensors are both activated, but in this structure, which we will refer to as the C-terminal C domain, CTD bent structure, um, the pore is closed. Whereas in this structure here to the right, who, which we will refer to as CTD straight, because this helix here is straight, um, in the presence of PIP2, then the pore is open. Um, so this uh, puts us in a good position to be able to do molecular dynamic simulations and to investigate whether this structure here is actually uh, relevant since there is always PIP2 in the membrane. Uh, what's the physiological relevance of solving this structure in the absence of PIP2? Um, plus uh, related to the fact that the VSD is uh, is in an activated state, whereas the pore uh, is closed. So that doesn't seem like it would be important for physio physiology. Um, and um, and uh, we want to fully annotate this structure to make sure that it is actually also uh, 
relevant for uh, in the, the biological function. Um, so um, the way we went about doing this uh, this uh, this research was to start with uh, the experiment. So as I said, done in the lab of Jan Min Sui. And uh, what they uh, had noticed from this structure is that there was an interaction between the linker here, between the second and third hel helices of the voltage sensor domain called the S2-S3 linker that interacted with the calmodulin uh, domain. And since we're interested in looking at the role of calmodulin, they uh, decided to carry out a functional scan of these um, of these residues and mutate them systematically to alanine and tryptophan um, along this whole sequence of the S2-S3 linker. And what you can see when uh, on these plots is the uh, activation of the voltage sensor at which voltage it occurs. So here we have closed channels, here we have open channels, and here in between we have um, intermediately open channels. Um, and what you can see is that um, inserting mutations sometimes leads to a shift in this activation voltage. And this is marking that it makes it more difficult for the channel to open. So by carrying out the scan, what they were able to see is that there were uh, positions here at the beginning of the S2-S3 linker that were uh, seemed to be important since mutating them led to pretty big shifts, making the channel more difficult to open. Whereas the last part of the linker here didn't seem as important. And they complemented this work by introducing um, uh, um, charge uh, mutations because they thought that it could be important um, to have the proper electrostatic interactions. And indeed, what we can see here is that there are two residues, R181 and S182. When they are mutated to a different charge, R181E and S182K, that we have a very big shift in the uh, activation voltage. Now, um, from the structure, we can see that uh, R181 interacts with PIP2, whereas S182 interacts with, uh, oh, that was a mistake, I'm sorry. Um, whereas S182 interacts with calmodulin. So this uh, led us to propose that there might be different mechanisms at play here. So the, the second um, experiment that was done here was to uh, now do the very similar experiment but introducing mutations on the interacting partner, so calmodulin here in orange. And so um, they mutated the residues that were close to uh, S182, which I mentioned was interacting with calmodulin just before, and carried out the, the same type of scan. And um, what was realized here is that uh, Y100, N138, and E140 seem to all lead to pretty big uh, differences in terms of the voltage shift. And um, Y100 caught their eye particularly because it seems to be follow a similar pattern than what we saw before in that the mutation to uh, charge residue uh, leads to a particularly important uh, voltage shift and that is similar to what we just uh, talked about in S182. And by scrutinizing the structure we see that these two residues may be in contact um, so that uh, led um, our collaborators to carry out these so-called double mutant um, uh, cycle analysis. And so uh, what you can see here is that the mutation of Y to D, like we just said before, leads to a pretty uh, big shift in the background of the wild type um, um, KCNQ1. But when S182 is uh, introduced, the shift is the same whether you have the Y to D mutant or whether you don't. And this tends to indicate that there is a functional interaction between the two residues since mutating one of them is enough to cause the whole um, phenotype. Um, so this taken together uh, tended to indicate that there is a functional interaction as in the structure that was resolved in the absence of PIP2. Um, and so that was a first interesting result. But then uh, since we were involved in the collaboration, we decided to see if we could probe this a little further using molecular dynamic simulations. 
And uh, to do this, what we did is a uh, uh, repeat of microseconds worth of simulations of these channels, and then decided to use network analysis to study the long range interactions between uh, the different proteins, protein domains. So um, network analysis uh, is uh, quite interesting because it allows to take an overall view on the structure, um, but after having done molecular dynamic simulations. And so that means that we can look not only at, at a static picture, but we can look at um, the entire um, the, the entire trajectory, but in a kind of um, uh, overall um, approach. Um, I do want to stress that these network analyses are carried out in a specific state of the channel. So they do measure in a way how allosteric can be trans uh, or how signal can be transported allosterically uh, through, uh, throughout the protein but they don't reflect the functional cycle, right, of going from one state to the other. But nevertheless, we can obtain quite interesting um, information. So how this works is that every residue in the protein is going to be uh, a node, and then we measure how frequently this uh, residue interacts with uh, the other residues in the protein by using a distance criterion. And uh, then we also measure the strength of interaction by calculating the mutual information, um, which um, indicates, uh, broadly speaking, how two residues uh, tend to interact or tend to um, have correlated uh, motions. And then we analyze this network uh, by using uh, basically uh, graph theory and we measure the flow of information that goes from a specific part of the protein to another specific part. So in this case, we'll be in, mostly interested in how the information gets transferred from the voltage sensor domain to the pore. And by using current flow analysis, we can look at the different residues that are located along pathways that uh, connect information transfer from the source to the sink. So this is what uh, this looks like on the CTD band structure that was resolved in the absence of PIP2, uh, considering the gating charge as a source and the gate as a sink. Um, and uh, first of all, the interesting, maybe an obvious observation is that um, the information uh, gets transferred through the regions that are the most uh, deep blue, uh, and that is uh, through the interface between the um, S4 helix to S5 to the gate. But additionally to this, uh, and this is more visible on these profiles than it is on the structure, we also see that there is a small peak, but that is quite distinct uh, at this residue S182, which we had pinpointed as important um, functionally. And conversely, if you look at the information flow on Calmodulin, we also see peaks at Y100 and, and 138, which were the residues that were um, highlighted in the functional scan. So this gives us good confidence that this type of um, network analysis on the MD trajectory can pick up important uh, residues that are verified experimentally. The next step uh, that we took on this was to see uh, what happens uh, when the, um, the protein transitions from the CTD bent structure to the CTD straight structure. And to do this, we calculated this uh, same information flow on the new structure. But then what I want to highlight will be the difference between the two. So on these plots here, you have the profile that corresponds to the CTD bent in blue, the CTD straight in green. And um, then this will be the delta, so the difference between the, the two profiles. What can be clearly seen here is that when we move from the CTD uh, band to the CTD straight structure, we're losing information transfer at S182, at Y100, and at N138, which is not surprising since this uh, interaction is broken in the structure and in these simulations. Um, but then, quite interestingly, we saw um, that there was another region here that is losing also information transfer, and that is the region that is present here in the blue box, which is highlighted here. 
And uh, I'll come back uh, in the next set of experiments to what that means. One really kind of interesting um, thing that came out of this analysis is that when we compare these two information flows, uh, we see that there is a lot of a lot more uh, information that is transferred from the VSD to the pore through the S4S5 linker and this brown region highlighted here. And this region had been shown before to be specific for the activated open state. Remember, I was telling you before that these um, channels activate in two states, the uh, in two steps, uh, transfer through the intermediate state and the activated state. And so this uh, gives us quite confidence that this uh, specific structure in the CDD straight state is the activated open state. So that's the first answer to assigning this functional state. Um, now back to this, um, this region that I was highlighting that was in blue just before. Uh, we, uh, we, we saw that this region was important, like I said, and by just comparing the structure, we were able to see that this is the region where there's the most conformational chain going on when going from CTD band to CTD straight. Um, and so what we did to see a little bit more clearly um, the way the information was transferred from the CAL modulin to the pore is we did again this uh, network analysis, but instead of having the sources that were in the voltage sensor, now we have the sources that are in the CAL modulin. And so uh, we then plot again the same, um, the same profiles and compare the profile um, when uh, the, the first one in blue when we were going from VSD to pore to uh, the one in orange that corresponds to going from Kalmodian into pore. And again, when we look at the delta here, the difference between the two profiles, we can see that this region shows up as uh, very important when initiating the network uh, analysis in the Kalmodian region. And um, this uh, region, which is the one that I was just saying, is rearranged. Uh, seems to be a hub in the C-terminal domain that seems to um, control the, the opening uh, or the coupling between the, the coupling uh, to the port. And uh, when we look at our simulations, we find that, in fact, three residues that are important here form uh, inter-subunit contacts in the CTD band structures, but they form intra-subunit ones in the CTD straight structure. So this region seems to be really interesting and important uh, functionally for transforming information that will lead the gate to open. So to verify uh, this a uh, bit more, uh, what uh, was done by our collaborators is to again use mutagenesis on the residues that were shown as important for uh, through our um, network analysis. And um, these figures are, uh, there's quite a lot to unpack here, but I want what I want you to focus on is the difference between this red curve, which is, remember, that was the mutation uh, that was at the uh, interface between the voltage sensor domain and the CAL modulin, um, and that had created a right shift compared to wild type, right? Uh, now, when we mutate P369 and P535, which are two residues that were shown as important in the previous analysis, we can see that basically we lose completely this right shift and we get uh, much, this is the blue curve and the green curve, um, we get much closer to wild type. And so this means that um, basically when we introduce this mutation on top of the uh, original mutation, then we're losing the the effect of that first mutation. So this tends to indicate that there's a sequence of events and that uh, in coupling the voltage sensor to the pore, this residue is kind of downstream of the, uh, of the first one. So this led us to propose that this hub in the C-terminal domain works in concert with the Kalmodian and VSD interface to control opening. Um, and so putting all of this uh, together, uh, we were able to come up with a model that kind of complements the structures nicely. And uh, as remember, I was telling you, we were trying to functionally annotate these, um, these structures 
in the beginning. So through um, through this, we were able to see or to confirm, as expected, that the CTD straight structure corresponds to the activated open state where the voltage sensor is activated and open. And we were able to confirm that the CTD bent state where there is um, a contact between the S2S3 linker and Kalmodulin, marked here by the star symbol, is a part of the functional cycle. Um, so the, the way we see this is that uh, when PIP2 is not bound, then we have this interaction, but then when PIP2 comes and binds to this interface, it competes with Kalmodulin and actually outcompetes it, leads Kalmodulin to detach and then the pore to open along this pathway. And through experiments that I couldn't show you uh, because of time here, we were able to see whether this CTD bent structure actually, uh, or the transition between CTD bent to CTD straight, we were able to say that it doesn't occur uh, during the transition from resting to intermediate state, but instead between intermediate state and activated state. Um, and that was done through uh, very nice experiments that uh, are really kind of, um, uh, for which Jan Min and his uh, colleagues in his lab are really experts of. So um, this concludes this part of the story that I wanted to tell you. And um, I hope uh, this was uh, con this convinced you that by combining in a clever way molecular dynamic simulations, pretty basic ones actually, we did nothing fancy here in terms of enhanced sampling, just taking the structures and simulating them, but analyzing them using the network analysis uh, helps us to propose um, uh, targeted mutagenesis experiments that give us insights into pretty complicated functions. And we're actually uh, sort of um, continuing this work, trying to see if we can model this big conformational change. And uh, on the experimental side, they're also uh, using fluorescence measurements to see if they can capture the conformational change. So that will be uh, what we're interested in. Um, right, so that was uh, for the first part of the talk. And now I want to move on to uh, the second part I promised to talk about, which is modulation by lipid-like molecules. And here we're specifically interested in resin acid derivatives um, that are sort of reminiscent, maybe a little bit of cholesterol in this kind of uh, of a molecule. Um, so resin acid derivatives promote a voltage gated channel opening in particular uh, shaker. And uh, here, contrary to what you uh, saw in the previous, in the first part of the talk, you can see that uh, the addition of a hundred micromolar of this compound makes the channel much uh, easier to open relative to the control uh, membrane. And um, these, uh, these um, molecules, they're uh, mostly hydrophobic, so they partition into the lipid, but then they have a negatively charged head group at uh, neutral pH. Um, and so this means that they orient with the head group that is uh, in the head group region, or this negatively charged group, it partitions into the head group region of the bilayer, whereas this goes into the, the membrane. And previous work by our collaborators uh, in Frederick Ellinger's lab had uh, proposed that this, um, these compounds act on the channel via an electrostatic mechanism. Um, so this is uh, the picture that was proposed before, as we've just talked about, S4 uh, moves up upon activation and causes an elastic change that will open the pore. Um, and um, and um, I didn't mention this in the previous part of the talk, but this, um, but I think this was covered also by, uh, quite nicely by Pancho Bezanila, I think, during the first day of the workshop. So S4 moves not only up, but it also moves in a helix uh, rotation motion, uh, creating this kind of, uh, this kind of shape. Um, and so the idea here is that if you have a negatively charged head group that is able to bind in this pocket, then this uh, motion upward and clockwise looking from the top is going to be favored. Uh, and so this explains why we have a left shift here in uh, the conductance voltage plots. 
And one of the proofs for this is that introducing two extra charges uh, that are the semi-transparent um, circles here, they uh, induce a larger effect. So this means that channels that contain this 2R motif that was introduced through mutagenesis, they um, have an even larger uh, left shift on the, uh, on the voltage curve here. Um, so that was what was proposed by uh, these collaborators. But then there was one effect that they weren't able to, um, to explain uh, through this mechanism. And that is when they mutate this first gating charge, R1 here, to glutamine, so losing the charge here, we would expect um, a lower binding affinity for the compound, right? And so a diminished effect. But uh, some of the compounds that uh, are these resin acid derivatives, like this compound here, we can see on this plot that when the charge is mutated to Q, um, then we have actually a higher uh, shift uh, than we have in the wild type. So the, the dotted line here marks um, the one-to-one -one ratio. So some of the compounds don't have an effect uh, or don't change um, uh, effect when the, the mutation is inserted, but some others have a much larger effect. And uh, this is really counterintuitive because um, mutating R1, right, should make it lower the affinity and, um, and make the, the, the closed state more stable. Um, so with this study, what we tried to do is to answer three questions. Uh, first of all was, uh, why do resin acid derivatives have a larger shifting effects on the channel that has the 2R motif, as I introduced two slides ago? The second was, why does this R1Q mutation increase the shift for some compounds instead of reducing it? And then finally, um, there is uh, another effect, uh, which is that the compounds that have a longer and flexible stock that uh, carries their, um, their charge, which you can see by comparing these two compounds. For example, this one has a longer, larger, more flexible stock than this one. Um, these ones are less affected by this R1Q mutation I mentioned uh, than the more compact uh, ones. And so here we use a similar uh, type of approach than what we've done before, which is combining docking and MD simulations with electrophysiology of mutants. Um, and, uh, and so we start again with the experiments. Uh, and here what we show is that looking at these three compounds, the ones that have a short stock and the ones that have a longer stock, uh, yields a similar shift in the channel that has a 2R mutation. So you can see these red curves, they all end up with a similar uh, shifting effects. But in wild type, the compounds that have a longer stock have a much smaller shift. And this is sort of confirmed um, through these new experiments. And then affinity is similar for wild type and mutant, as you can see through the concentration needed uh, to attain the same type of uh, shift is the same, uh, but it is larger for, for example, um, or the, the affinity is larger for Wu181 than it is for the other two. Um, so we then uh, used uh, simulations to keep going, so kind of keeping a similar approach. And we started by docking um, the compounds to the uh, position that was initially uh, suggested by uh, the previous work by uh, Frederick and his group. And so we did docking. Um, I should say docking does not take into account the membrane bilayer. So we, have, we had to heavily edit the docking and select poses that were compatible with uh, the idea that the, uh, the greasy body of the compound should be in the bilayer and the head group should be in contact with the the head groups of the lipids. And through this, what uh, you can see is that this pocket that was predicted by Frederick and colleagues before is actually quite unstable. So uh, in a lot of the subunits, you can see that the compound leaves. And quite interestingly, in this specific subunit, starting in this pocket here, leads the compound to kind of change completely positions and 
go to a different uh, pocket. And uh, this is what can be seen on these distance plots a long time. And even in the subunits where it's relatively uh, well, um, uh, well bound, you can see that even towards the end of the one microsecond trajectory, we start losing interactions. And so what we could uh, see here is that we have quite different interaction patterns in the four subunits. And this tends to tell us that uh, this is not a really convincing binding pose that we started from. Now, quite interestingly, and in line with what uh, the experiments show, um, we did the same, but in the channel that has the extra two charges, the two R motif. And in that case, we can see uh, very different behavior with a very tight binding in all four subunits. So this is compatible by with uh, what we saw in experiments. And also we can pinpoint that the two extra charges that were introduced, R356 and R359, interact with the head group of the compound in a pretty um, uh, uh, stable way. So then this leads us to this question. I just showed you experimentally, right, that the affinity is similar in wild type and 2R, but in MD, we, even though this is not proof because we're not measuring free energies, we, we seem to see a pretty different stability. Um, so this led us to propose that there might be other binding sites. And one possible binding site uh, was revealed through our uh, previous simulation, like I showed you. In the case of the wild type, there was one compound that kind of left this pocket to go to a different one. Um, and this pocket is uh, located at the junction between the, the pore domain and the voltage sensor domain, kind of interesting uh, if you think about it in terms of the, the coupling between the two domains. And this pocket in the absence of compound uh, is occupied by a lipid molecule uh, quite consistently. So we did the same thing. We docked the compounds according to a similar procedure to than we had done before. And uh, we ran simulations, again, uh, quite long ones. And this gave us a very different picture in the case of the wild type, right? You can see that these compounds are very stable in this pocket. And in fact, we highlight the residues that are responsible for this stability. And we find that the head group interacts with the one or the other or both of these top gating charges, depending on the subunit. Um, and then we have an important um, uh, aromatic residue, W454, which makes interactions with the uh, ring-like body of the compound. And uh, this is the quantification of this, showing you a very stable interaction over quite a long time scales. Um, so then we suggested to Frederick and his group to carry out the mutations of these compounds. The mutation of R362 we already covered quite extensively. We knew it was giving rise to a big left shift. And we suggested to mutate also W454. Uh, which we had just mentioned uh, seemed important for binding. And you can see that the shift in W454A um, is quite reduced um, in the wild type. This is the quantification here. Now, what's quite interesting is when we introduce W454A in the background of R362Q, we end up with a... a a change uh, in the G in the GV shift that is actually not significant, and uh, that was really puzzling. Uh, but simulating this, we came up with uh, a possible explanation, and that is that when the tryptophan is mutated to alanine, we end up with a uh, a compound that can bind even further deeper into this pocket and interact with another aromatic residue that is here in the back F416. Um, so this led us to propose a pretty complicated model uh, that helps to recapitulate all the data and especially explain uh, this shift in R362, uh, which, remember, I was uh, saying was a mystery since uh, we should expect that neutralization of R362 should um, lead to uh, loss of affinity, right? And the way we explained this was uh, through invoking that there is possibly a more open state or a more activated state uh, 
where the S4 helix has turned even one um, step further. And when that is the case, in the case of R1Q, then we can see that the compound will bind more strongly. And since it's the balance between the open states and the closed states that tells us about um, the GV shift, this explains why the R362Q mutation might be um, leading to uh, a bigger shift. And uh, without going too much into details, because I'm running out of time, um, we use the same model to show why the W454A uh, mutation leads to a much smaller shift, and that's because we stabilize the closed states. But then um, the double mutation here, uh, if we use the, the same logic, uh, we can see that it ends up uh, binding in the open state. And so then the shift in this mutant and um, in this one will be similar. Um, and um, I, can you, can you tell me I'm out of time now? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, yes, you can go to the conclusion. So we have time for at least one question. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I'll stop this. Um, but I'll say that we did an additional set of simulations with these long stock compounds. And that, uh, helped, that explained to us why this compound were not binding in this uh, specific uh, site. And uh, that is because when we have such a, a long stock, we can't have both a, an interaction with W454 and, R, and the arginines. And that explains why um, this, um, this compound does not bind in there. And so together, we have answers to these four questions uh, where uh, we explained that the binding to this S3S4 site, the original one that was um, proposed, uh, stabilizes the open states only in the presence of the 2R motif. Um, and uh, that binding to the S4 pore site stabilizes the O state, but then when we have the R1Q mutation, probably we're stabilizing an extra state that was never observed experimentally. And the compounds with a longer stock, they can bind as well in the S4 pore site. And so this means that they act mostly via the S4, S3, S4 site when the 2R motif is present. And that explains why they don't have a large shift in the absence of the 2R motif. And uh, to conclude, uh, we have uh, quite um, the possibility maybe to introduce selectivity with these kinds of compounds because we have channels that have extra charges at the top of S3, S4, and we have also charges. Uh, we have some channels that have a tryptophan in a position similar to Shaker, and some that don't. So with this, we think that we can maybe engineer uh, interesting compounds. And um, so to conclude, MD simulations, I think, can assist in working out the molecular basis of ion channel regulation by the environment. And um, moving forward, one thing I'm really interested in is becoming able to estimate the binding affinities of the molecules. And this is something we can't do. And I think that's the main bottleneck to be able to contribute to drug design of such complicated molecules that really cannot be um, uh, studied with uh, docking, for example. So thank you for your attention. I'm kind of sorry I went a bit over time. Thank you, Lucy, for this very, very nice talk about these complex uh, proteins. And we have a question from uh, Fabio Cecconi saying, uh, great talk. How did you estimate the probabilities to obtain the transfer of information in the network picture? Thanks. Uh, yeah, this is done uh, through uh, graph theory. And so basically it's done um, through analyzing uh, so-called current flow betweenness. Um, and so the idea is basically that uh, you uh, take the graph, you calculate the Laplacian, and uh, from there you, um, you pretend that you inject a unit of current at the level of the source and you see which path the current takes to get to the sink. And then you repeat that many times and this creates a, an ensemble of random walks and you collect all of the data to then be able to quantify uh, which residues have a high so-called betweenness, which means that they're often on pathways between the source and the sink. Uh, 
Okay, and we still have two minutes, so I have a curiosity. Uh, concerning the first system that you showed, about the time scales of, uh, the, um, of the processes. So how long is uh, the system staying in the resting state or on the, in the active state, if you have this information? Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a good question. So like I said, in this specific work, we only looked at um, the specific um, simulations of the specific states that we had structures for. So we did not attempt to, um, to look at the conformational change for the moment. So this means that simulations that we have, uh, I don't have a picture here, um, we, we do them over about one microsecond and then we repeat them a few times to be able to gather statistics. Uh, and this is enough because we're really localized in a free energy minimum, right? Um, but then we are very interested, like I said in the conclusion, in simulating the conformational change. And this, I, we don't actually know the timescales for this. This is why our collaborators are doing these fluorescence experiments to try and measure this. Um, but uh, we do expect it to occur on a very long timescale, given the uh, type of conformational change that involves the whole rotation of an entire domain. And so for this, we, um, we expect to, of course, need enhanced sampling simulations. And uh, we have quite a lot of expertise working with those kinds of um, simulations on different systems. But this is the biggest conformational change, I think, that we will be attempting ever. Um, so I, I don't have a, a good answer in terms of how this will, will happen. Um, but um, yeah, it's not quite straightforward uh, to do. So what we've been doing currently with other systems is we use um, sort of machine learning tools to look at the important degrees of freedom between two states. And then we use those as collective variables as input for different types of methods, like string method with swarms of trajectories or even targeted MD or steered MD. Uh, but it's difficult to tell you right now what will work or not work. Okay, so we will wait for the results. Thank you again, Lucy, for uh, your talk.